One of the hardest parts of hunting on your own is knowing exactly where to find the game. You can pore over maps for hours on end, carefully study the weather patterns, even ask locals or forest service rangers for information. In the end, it's a game of battleship for the hunter. Sometimes the research pans out, other times it's a guessing game. Nature is nearly impossible to predict with 100% accuracy, but that's exactly why the hunter ventures out into the unknown, ready for a challenge. On your own hunters like Randy Newberg thrive in these man versus nature situations. Randy prepares for this elk hunting challenge by entering Custer National Forest two days before the season to scout the land. Custer National Forest was brought into the National Forest Reserve System, now the National Forest System, by Theodore Roosevelt. He brought this, along with 100 million other acres, into the public estate. And it has great elk hunting if you can get a limited permit. It has great mule deer hunting. It has turkey hunting. It has pretty much everything, like a lot of our public land. Last spring, I'd been turkey hunting here, and I saw a lot of really good elk shed. And I said, you know, this country lends itself to really cool elk hunting. I'd like to come and try it. This is a classic spot for in the rut. Normally, you'd see trees like this just rubbed all, all down, but not today. A lot of people will email and say, how do you determine where you're going to hunt? First thing I do is I grab the map and I say, where is it going to be the most difficult for people to get into, either because of terrain or because of lack of roads? And all of my effort gets focused on that to start with. Forest Service property line is just about straight west. I'm just going to keep going on these ridges, glassing down in and see what I can see. So I put my name in the hat and the limited entry draw the odds are like 1 in 12. I'm thinking, yeah. Hardly worth the stamp I'm putting on the envelope. And I drew, I, I, I was like, wow. But if I hadn't been here turkey hunting and doing that in the spring, I probably would have never applied here. I would have never thought about elk being here. Right now, it's a mess. It's hiding in this grove of trees here, trying to get out of the wind for a while. I really can't glass. The rain messes up your visibility. You can't see more than about six or 700 yards. For those of you non-residents who are thinking of doing this, the first thing you got to do is you got to get your Montana General Elk Tag. The deadline for that is March 15th. Once you draw that, you can put into the limited elk permit draws, which this is, with all of us residents. And if you draw, you could have come and done the same thing that I did. Weather forecast it. Four more days of rain, which if it got cold enough and snowed, that would be unbelievable good fortune for hunting. This was a hunt where I'd never been here elk hunting before and I said I got to give myself as many days as possible to scout. So I came over two days before season and I scouted. I had this spot I said this is where there's going to be a big bull. I went in there two days of scouting. I did not see a bull. I didn't see an elk. My buddy Bart May is supposed to be joining me but he couldn't make it. I'm hoping he's going to get here tomorrow night. Right now I'm doing it solo. When it's this frustrating, it's nice to have another guy to hunt with. It just kind of brings your spirits up. And I'll see what I can find. Hopefully I find at least one more elk than I found in two days of scouting. I just stepped outside. And I wish that it would change from rain to snow. But I'm gonna go find a big elk today. Come back and build a fire and life will be grand. I gotta drive my ATV for over an hour in this stuff. And then I gotta hoof it for about another half hour, 45 minutes to get to where I think the elk are. So. I went in there two days of scouting. I did not see a bull. I didn't see an elk. But my gut had me so convinced that there was going to be elk in there opening day, I went in there again anyhow. Even though there was four or five inches of fresh snow, I'll cut a track. I'll find them. Opening morning. 
I'm the only fool in here. You know, a lot of people will send me an email and say, Randy, what's the, gonna be my biggest challenge when I go elk hunting? The physical part of being in shape creates so many challenges because of the terrain, because of the work it takes to get an elk out. This is my third day in here. I've yet to see an elk. Anyone who hunts knows how much fun it is to be the first set of boot prints in fresh snow for miles and miles and miles. It's four hours I've been hiking, thinking I'd cut a fresh track in the snow. No luck. I don't know what to do. I went on a hunch. My gut told me to come in here because there's agriculture a mile or two that way. Sometimes you guess and you guess wrong. The way hunting is, there's nothing you can do about this. You think you got it figured out. You study, you research, you think, I got a plan. I got it figured out. And then you get humbled like this. It kind of reminds you that you really don't have a clue when it comes to hunting, Randy. With any luck, my buddy Bart will come today. He's kind of a lucky guy. So this is what I do. This is what I love to do. I'm so excited that I have this tag. At any moment, I could peek over a ridge or down in a draw or across a canyon, and there could be the bull I'm looking for right there. Holy smokes, what a hike. So many people look at the intimidation of a Western big game hunt, of doing it on their own. Seven hours, pretty much nonstop, nonstop. I don't think there are any elk in here. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but I'll guarantee you when you got those antlers on your shoulders and you're gonna say, you know what? As much work as this is, it's worth every bit of it. Uh, Bart's here. What time he gets here? I'm Bart May. I'm a friend of Randy Newberg's, and I guess I'm the extra eyes and packer boy. What took you so long, Bart? <laughs> it's a muddy road getting in here. <laughs> For me, hunting with someone else, provides a whole nother set of benefits. And when I came back to camp, I was completely wore out physically and mentally. That afternoon when Bart showed up, all of a sudden the excitement level came back up, the enthusiasm, the optimism. I went on the longest hike this morning. Anything? Nope. I think there's some allure with hunting season or fishing season. There's an opening day to each one of those that people just get, it's a tradition, you know, it's, and it's deep rooted. I've, I went and looked at some other places south of here about 40 miles. They just look like really good elk country. I did tell you Monday was the day. You so. did, so I'll teach me to hunt on Sunday. Huh? <laughs> I don't hunt on Sunday. I mean, he's a great friend and he respects my beliefs and I think that's awesome. And, and besides all the tactics and strategy part of having a partner, to me, hunting with another guy has just helped me immensely, and, and especially a great guy like Bart. Oh, me out of the bag, I hate doing dishes. Well, the second morning, we went to a spot that I'd scouted, but I knew you couldn't get in there because the roads were so bad. Well, I wasn't gonna walk four miles at that point. So Bart says, I wonder if we could trailer the four-wheelers down there and I think get out on the roads. Early when it's frozen, but know that when you come out, moisture okay. comes up, it's gonna be a disaster. But So what we did is we took the ATVs on a road that's open to driving your pickup, but it still was really, really bad. Really? On Sunday, on the opening day of rifle season in Montana, that people were struggling to get around. It made our game plan a lot different, so we decided to go try an area that, that had a lot of roads, but it had a potential to have elk in it. One thing that does happen with the amount of ATV use on these public lands is you're going to have other hunters getting further back and further back as long as there are open trails and open roads. But some places are so heavily roaded, you can hardly get away from all the trails and roads. This would be a classic example of that. And so you just go and hunt. A lot of people think of national forests, they think of the West, and they think of these high alpine, dark timber forests. You get some of these, what I'm gonna call, inner mountain or eastern mountain national forest like the Custer. And it's ponderosa pine, it's not the dark timber. And the animals behave differently. The access is different. 
There's just a whole different play of things that make it a very unique experience. So I think if we just stay along this okay. timber, and think, but once we get to that ridge, we could glass all sides and yeah. drop off either side if we see some. Well, we're gonna hunt kind of some, bordering some of the private land that we had two or three miles to work with the forest. And as we were crossing some of the open and broken terrain there, we saw some fresh tracks that they'd been out that night. But we're out in this wide open middle of nope. Circle up on top of that ridge where we can look down. So we continue to walk, continue to walk, and now we know that the, these tracks on that crusted snow are so flaky that we know that there are elk there. We gotta get back out of here. Yeah, we gotta get back out of here fast. We don't have any vegetation, no cover other than just the topography and terrain. So we come back over the ridge and we use just the, the undulations of the terrain. The one looks like a bull and just by color, I mean, I didn't consider it. As close as we could get is 600 yards. Got one down in the bottom here. Let's, let's inch that way to use that big yeah. one as our shield yeah. and then, let's do and then that. try so we it. we cut back around the back of the hill to get some cover and kind of used a couple big, huge ponderosa trees as a shield. and and worked our way up on this knob. And within 10 minutes, they all bedded down. They did it where the wind's coming over the crest of the ridge so they can smell you coming from behind, and they can look down and see everything you coming. Welcome to the world of On Your Own Adventures. We couldn't move. If we were to move down to get some cover, we had to go about 125 yards before we were out of sight. So we sat there a long time. So we're sitting there thinking, now what do we do? The wind's starting to blow. We're starting to get cold from the hike in there. I'm about ready to just drop down here and see if I can get across. The bull is walking up the hill. Bart says, don't you have an antelope tag? We'll look over there. And I look over there, and here's a group of antelope coming right towards us. I know this was a risk. We leave the cover of that ponderosa tree, and I go up over this ridge. Well, everyone who knows me knows that even if there's a big bull bedded 600 yards away, if that antelope comes within shooting range, I'm gonna shoot that antelope. And those antelope all bunch up, and I didn't dare shoot, because I'm afraid, all right, I'm gonna kill more than one antelope. The benefit of that was it showed us that those elk weren't that afraid of what we were doing. We had to make a big, almost mile-long loop to get back here and stay out of their sight. Bart left his rifle, his back, I left my back. Just out of frustration more than anything, I asked Bart, do you think you could cow call and get that bull to bugle? Finally decided that it was, we were gonna try to make a move in to get down into the timber instead of waiting, you know, seven or eight hours. So we get down into some cover. I'm gonna go try to cow call. Okay. Just see. The good part is if he tries to, if he tries to circle that land, yep. he's gotta come right in that open. He ain't gonna go Sure enough, I decided to scoot back and start a cow calling, and then that bull just started screaming. As Bart would stay back, and I would move forward as I heard the bugles, and I'm playing the wind, I'm trying to figure out where are these elk, get up on this bench that kind of comes around behind them, and all of a sudden that bull comes up maybe 80, 100 yards below me and just hmm, lets out a bugle. I'm like, holy cow, this could happen. Right there. Just make out his antlers, but he's standing right behind that big tree. All of you who hunt know how frustrating it is to be that close, to have elk file across through the timber in front of you at 80 yards, 100 yards, and no shot. There's not an opening anywhere. You know, with him bugling, he was just giving away his location, and so I, I hung back to just try to keep it talking. Well, all this time, Bart is back behind me, two, three hundred yards, but he has no idea what's going on up where I am. And I'm thinking, all right, it's getting late in the day. I'm afraid that those elk smelled something, and they're moving. So I drop back, come back through the trees again, and now there's another big crest in front of me. There's more coming from the light. And I peek over that, and there are cow elk everywhere below me. Can you find that big one? Right here. 
boom, I see him come out from down below me. And he's pushing the same small cow again. And they're moving out there. He's walking straight away. And every elk here is looking at me. And at this point, I'm like, oh, this is not going to work out. I, here's my one chance down the tubes. I can't shoot. Well, his little cow comes and leads him straight away from me. Come on, buddy. For some reason, that elk stops right beside this little ponderosa. I mean, it's almost like he's gonna rub it or something. And I'm just saying, all right, turn broadside, mister. Please, please. Come on, turn. It's straight away. And it seemed like forever. It might have only been 20 seconds that he stood there. He turns almost broadside. <sighs> Take a deep breath. I relax. Where'd he go? I don't see him. He ran in those trees. There go the rest of them, but I don't see him. I made a great shot, perfectly right behind the front shoulder. But all this time, Bart is behind me. He has no idea what's going on. I cow called and he kind of whistled to me um, and I knew I, I was really close to him and so I ran up there and I was like, gosh, are you seeing those elk? Was that you that shot? And I heard you shoot and I was like, I didn't know if you were on that group. Or... They were all right down here under the left. Really? Yeah. I'm like, Bart, you are not going to believe what happened. How just frustrating and exhilarating and exciting this was. Yeah. I, I hope he's laying down there. And Bart's like, well, let's go check it out. Would have been way too easy to shoot him when he was right out here in the open. Yeah, why don't you wait till he gets out there? <laughs> and we drop down the hill. We don't even get down there very far, and Bart stops and he glasses. There's something there, Randy. What's that? Right here. Isn't that his butt right there? That's him. <laughs> <laughs> he's laying there, Dad. He, didn't, he even, didn't make it. He didn't even go anywhere. 30 yards? No, he's just right there. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> And I was, I was so excited for him because he wanted, he wanted so bad to get a nice bull. And we, and the bull that was chasing that cow was a nice six point, you know, a nice mature, heavy antlered bull. And oh wow, nice bull! Ooh. Wow! <laughs> and so we dropped down there, and sure enough, there he was—an unbelievable bull that anyone I know would be so thankful to have. And there's definitely bigger bulls in the unit, but as far as cool looking with this big, long, swept down beam, the body size, my goodness, we got our work cut out for us. <laughs> for those of you who plan out a, a hunt like we did and work as hard as I did, come three days early, fight through rain, fight through snow, this is the reason, this is why we hunt. We trailered those ATVs this morning because we knew it was so right. muddy. We'd never get in here, but I don't think anyone else has been in here. No. Thank you. Even though I know there's all the packing, all the boning, all the field dressing, the whole idea that that bull represents an experience, a memory, a friendship that I'll never forget. Oh, it was awesome. You, this is just like a dream hunt to yeah. actually be able to hunt them with a rifle when they're chasing cows. and. Who would have thought this late in the season that they were still been a hot cow? And I would have never thought that. It's going to be so many things to me, just like your hunts are to you. And I hope that when you see a hunt like this, it causes you to say, I want to go try something new like that. I came in as cold as anybody else, did it on my own with my buddy Bart. And if you are in the woods working at it, maybe this won't happen, but you're going to have fun. That's, that's what it's all about. That's why we do it. And now the fun is over and the work starts. After feeling discouraged by some unsuccessful scouting, Randy's spirits were lifted by hunting buddy Bart. Together they tackled a brand new hunting area and overcame the obstacles of weather and new terrain. So whether you explore new hunting grounds or revisit tried and true ones, on your own hunting itself, becomes the memorable and fulfilling experience. And the very best part of any on your own adventure is that it's completely accessible and completely achievable by you, the real American hunter.